Hello again, and welcome to the third and final plenary session on day three of the International Seating Symposium on February 2nd, 2022. Um, just a few uh, reminders and things to wrap up before we get into the actual plenary session itself. Uh, just again, a thank you uh, to our exhibitors who were able to pivot and do a great online um, virtual exhibit hall. A reminder that you'll still have access to all of the exhibitors' um, uh, videos and other things saved in their in their booths um, through the year. Uh, so we'd like to take some time to allow our friends um, with other seating symposia to give you a brief overview of what's to come for them. Uh, good morning, kia ora kato katoa. Uh, thank you for the invitation to briefly introduce the upcoming Oceania Seating Symposium to you all. I am really excited to share with you that our third Oceania Seating Symposium, which is a joint venture between Australia and New Zealand, is running as a virtual programme this year in the first week of April. Um, our need to go virtual is in many ways disappointing as we were this close to an in-person event. What it does do though is open up OSS to all of you and your international colleagues as an accessible event. The time difference isn't too bad. Our morning sessions for you uh, would kick off around lunchtime, Western Standard Time and mid-afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. Our three-day program is gonna have five streams running concurrently and the content is gonna be available to rewatch for three months. We have a great program planned that will showcase our practice in Australia and New Zealand. And we'll also have, we have a fantastic selection of speakers from the US, Canada, UK, Ireland, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark. Our invited speakers this year are Tim Atlam, Jean Minkle, Rachel McDonald, Elizabeth Nelson, Carly Holmes, and Amanda Lowry. The theme of OSS 2022 is Whanaungatanga, which is connecting communities and people. The word Whanaungatanga um, in um, Māori means different things to different people, but in essence, it paints a picture of belonging to something bigger than oneself, a bigger picture full of people that connect in a meaningful way. As we continue to experience these challenging times globally, this connection and our conversations are more important than ever. The Oceania Seating Symposium is an opportunity for the world mobility and seating community to reconnect and to share our experiences, strengthening not only our ties with each other, but our skill set and um, grow and be impactful in our positions within our communities. So check out our website for more details. Um, the program details are all there for you to have a look at. Uh, we hope to see you join us for the New Zealand hosted event online in April and um, in person in Melbourne, Australia in November 2023. Kia ora. Well, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm Simon, I'm from uh, the European Seating Symposium, and we are delighted to tell everybody that we will be in person in Dublin from the 14th to the 17th of June, which is a fantastic time of the year to meet everybody again after this was supposed to happen in 2020, and we pushed back twice, however, we won't be pushing back again. Ireland is open for business and we're, we can't wait to meet everybody coming over. Our sessions are up on the net, but we also would like you to come on holiday in Ireland because it's a perfect time of the year, around 30 degrees, sun is shining all day long, every day. And the most important part is you get to mingle with people that you haven't seen in a long time from the industry and also uh, to get new ideas and share all of the stuff that's been going on in your lives and the speakers' lives. Our, um, our platform is vast, so uh, I'm not gonna even try and go into it now. However, I would really love to see you all there. And um, flights are cheap, drink is cheap. Everything is cheap in Ireland. It's, we're such a cheap country. Um, 
but the most expensive thing is the fact that you've got the best speakers coming to Dublin on the 14th to the 17th of June, and we hope to see you all there. Hi everyone, it is amazing to see all these great uh, sitting symposiums around the globe. And I wanted to let you know that we also have different events in Latin America. We will have the Colombian Sitting Symposium in September this year, and the Latin American Sitting Symposium in October in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So join us in Latin America as well. We hope these events are um, live, are in person, I mean, but we are still not sure due to the situation. So I just added the websites to both conferences and hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Great, thank you all for those um, introductions to the upcoming, upcoming um, international symposia. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Perlman to um, introduce himself and the panel, as well as um, what's going to happen on this um, really exciting Global Perspectives on Wheelchair Policy panel. Thank you, Rachel, and um, <clears throat> I hope everybody has had a wonderful conference. Um, this is an exciting opportunity for me to moderate a panel of global experts on this topic, and so I'm excited just to kick it off. And I will start by having um, all of the panelists introduce themselves, and I'll start with Kendra Betts. Hi, thank you, John. My name is Kendra Betts. I'm a physical therapist with the Veterans Health Administration in the United States. Um, been working with the International Seating Symposium for at least the last 20 years, and I'm happy to be here representing a unique healthcare delivery system in the United States. Thank you, John. Thanks, Kendra. And Philippe? Yeah, I'm, I'm Philippe. Uh, I come from Portugal. Uh, I've been a seating consultant for more than 23 years now. Um, I've been working with uh, clients, uh, companies, dealers, uh, manufacturers uh, in both Latin America and um, Europe. I've been doing uh, a lot of education and uh, being a part of these uh, amazing events like the International Seating Symposium as well. Thanks, Philippe. Um, Nick? Hi, thank you everyone for having me here. My name is Nick Labasi. I am Vice President of Partnership Expansion with the United Spinal Association. We're a nonprofit, um, represent almost 60,000 members with spinal cord injury. I'm sure you've heard of us. I live in Northern New Jersey. Uh, I have a T10 spinal cord injury complete. I was injured 25 years ago. I use a tie light um, manual wheelchair. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Um, Kara? Hi, I'm Kara Maslink, and I'm an occupational therapist uh, by way of training. I have my PhD in interdisciplinary health sciences. I currently work for Western Michigan University and teach in the occupational therapy department. And I'm serving as the executive director of the Clinician Task Force, which is a nonprofit organization in the United States that advocates for CRT equipment. Thanks, Kara. Sarah? Thanks, Dr. P. My name is Sara Munera. I'm a physical therapist and I have a master's in rehab science and technology. I have been working for 10 years in wheelchair service provision here in Colombia and in Latin America. And I currently work as technical coordinator for the International Society of Wheelchair Professionals. And I'm also the founder of a company to improve access to assistive technology and to promote enabling environments for people with disabilities in Colombia and Latin America. And I'm super happy to be here. Thanks for being here, Sarah. Um, Emma? Oh, your audio is not working. No, still having trouble. Maybe while you play with that, we'll go to Liz. Sure. Hi there. Um, my name's Liz Turnbull. I'm service manager of a company called Setting to Go in New Zealand. Um, I'm an occupational therapist by profession. I've been working in wheelchairs and sitting for over 15 years. Um, sitting to go, the company I work for is a specialist wheelchair and sitting service, providing care to clients of all ages with complex needs through that middle region in New Zealand. Um, we're a service that have, offers assessment, repair and modification. And we've got a large team of uh, therapists and techs who work across three regional bases in New Zealand. Um, we're also the national contractor provider of training program. So um, 
within New Zealand, we offer a series of practical workshops for physios and occupational therapists who, um, and they're required to complete this, these um, workshops in order to become credentialed within our system. Um, we are also often contracted to provide clinical support and mentoring to less experienced therapists and clinical teams all over the country. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Liz. I'm happy to have you. And then finally, Emma. Thanks, John. My name is Emma Smith. I am an occupational therapist and a Marie Curie Research Fellow at the Assisting Living and Learning Institute at Maynooth University in Ireland. And although I live in Ireland, my, um, my background and I'm Canadian and my, my training and clinical ex experience were all in Canada. So I will speak from that perspective as well as from uh, the perspective of my research, which is around global assistive technology policy and access to AT. Great, well, thank you all again for participating in this panel. Um, I wanna remind um, all the uh, viewers that you can just add chat. If you have a question, please put it in the chat and we'll um, filter those through to all the different panelists. And the format of this will be a round table. So I have a couple of questions that I'll um, propose and um, have uh, just go around the table, the virtual table in this case, to have you each comment on them and hopefully build on each other's um, comments to, um, to generate discussion and then questions from, from the audience. Um, the first question is, uh, <clears throat> is really a, a request to give an overview of different policies. So what are the typical policy or payment models in your region? Um, are there novel parts of that um, that really work or shortcomings that you want to highlight? And um, we'll start with Kara uh, first to answer and then, um, you know, three to four minutes per panelist. And we'll make sure to give everybody a chance to talk. So I'll hand the mic over to you, Kara. Thank you. Uh, so to start off this conversation, I thought that it might be helpful just to give a little background on healthcare systems, especially just because the United States is so funky. So um, healthcare systems, we think about them ranging from a free market system over to a control market, which is typically more government run. And then we also have payer systems, which range from single payer to multi-payer systems. And so um, it within the healthcare system, there might be different priorities, right? So we might be uh, prioritizing treatment and services by drugs, surgeries, and treatments, which we would consider a curative system, more of a restorative system with PT and OT and speech therapy services, or more of a preventative system uh, where we might where they might focus more on reimbursing like prenatal care and mammograms and immunizations. And so the United States is what we really call a quasi market or an imperfect market. We have a multiple payer system um, and most of the focus is on covering curative services. So more of the drugs and surgeries and treatment. And we attempt to treat health problems once they, once they have arisen. And so I think that's important to take into consideration because especially um, when we think about the United States being a quasi market, one of the things that makes it so is that we have multiple payers and multiple insurance um, options. So in the United States, we have public options. We have a federal option that covers, uh, we call it Medicare, covers age 65 and over. And then also some people who have uh, chronic disability over 24 months. And then we also have um, a federal state combination that's administered, administered um, individually through the 50 states called Medicaid. And that's primarily for people who are low income. And those two public options are available almost as payer of last resorts. Um, Medicaid does have a premium or Medicaid does not have a premium because it is based on low income, whereas Medicare does have a premium for um, people over the age of 65 to pay. And so because of the low income priority of Medicaid, equipment service or um, seating and mobility equipment is covered at 100%, whereas for Medicare, it's covered at 80% with a 20% copay because uh, or um, deductible because of the emphasis on it being a insurance or insurance funding source for people over the age of 65 who are retired. Um, and then people can have Medicare, Medicaid combinations where Medicare might cover things first and then Medicaid would cover the rest. And so we, we have a lot of our beneficiaries or consumers who have multiple payer systems who come in to our clinics. Um, we 
also have are driven through employer and uh, largely follows Medicare and Medicaid. The healthcare providers and equipment suppliers are required to be in the service delivery process for seating and wheel mobile. And that covers, or it varies through the different insurance companies. Healthcare providers, we bill our time in the nation, whereas the equipment or CRT suppliers are paid by equipment reimbursement. Um, and just briefly, uh, what works is that we do have seating and mobility equipment coverage. So that we're really thankful for that for our consumers that we can get it. Um, there is some room for innovation and um, although we have to push for it pretty hard, but the multi-payer system leads to a whole lot of administrative needs and complexities that is difficult to navigate, uh, both for either even healthcare providers um, and then especially for the consumers and for uh, the people at the insurance companies. And so trying to navigate those very different uh, methods of funding can make it really complex when it comes to giving person-centered care. Thanks, Kara. You did a, an excellent job of, of, of describing the complexity that we have in the U.S. and appreciate, um, appreciate that overview. We'll pass it off to Emma, who um, comes from a much more simple system, so it's a good juxtaposition. You say that, John, but um, it may not be so true. So uh, I'm going to talk about the Canadian system, um, since that's where the bulk of my experience is. And Canada has similar complexity in some ways because Canada is federated, which means that the responsibility for healthcare spending and healthcare allocation falls to each of the provinces. So although there is uh, funds distributed on a federal level, each of the provinces is responsible for that allocation. And the consequence is that each of the provinces is, is responsible for setting their own policy around healthcare dollars and healthcare allocation. Canada does have a single payer health system, which is where the, it's perhaps a little more simple. Uh, simple. Um, so it is considered a universal healthcare system of sorts where the single payer is the government, and in this case, the provincial government. The challenge is of course, that because it varies substantially across provinces, there's significant inequity depending on the province in which you live regarding whether or not you get access to, um, to wheelchairs or to related equipment. So generally across the country, we would say that the focus is on what's considered basic or essential needs. So too bad if you need a wheelchair for participating in your community or leaving your house. Um, most of the payer systems focus only on use within the home. Um, and there's varying degrees of what that means on a province to province basis, but as a general statement, that would be true. Um, there's also different eligibility across provinces. So as an example, in Ontario, which is the biggest province in Canada, any person who has a health card and has access to public health care, which would be any citizen, permanent resident, uh, or anyone like that, would have access to 75% of funding for their required equipment. Um, if they were on disability support payments, they would then have access to 100% funding. And if they were a child, they would have access to 100% funding. Um, that's not means tested. That's just by virtue of having a health card. In British Columbia, as a, as a juxtaposition, um, which is another one of our biggest provinces, it is tied to disability support payments. So provided that you are on disability support payments, you can get access to the technology on in a certain list, it's not exhaustive. Um, but that support payment ends at the age of 65 when people go into the Canada Pension Plan. So once you pass that mark of getting coming off disability support payments and going into the Canada Pension Plan, your eligibility changes significantly. So as you can imagine, we look at the majority of people who are needing wheelchairs associated with aging are over the age of 65. This is particularly problematic. Um, it's also problematic, for example, if you're a student and you are therefore um, on in a student program and no longer on disability support payments because you're either considered employed part time or in a student place, um, you wouldn't be necessarily eligible for that same funding. So province to province, it, it does differ quite substantially. We do have several uh, federal programs which are national, but those only apply to members of the Canadian Armed Forces, to refugees, or to uh, Indigenous people who are covered under the plan. And that wouldn't include all Indigenous people, um, depending on how they are registered. So it includes most. Um, some provinces have partial payment systems where they are means tested, others do not. Um, and then some provinces also have loan programs where they have a loan bank, which is then distributed to individuals based on their need. 
Uh, there are also private insurers. So in addition to your basic provincial health care, you may have a private health plan or health insurer, and often that's paid for by your employer, and that may supplement what you have on the provincial level. Um, in terms of what's done well, I think there, there are some provinces which cover more than others, and it, it is done well. Um, and, so, for example, in Ontario, where it's not means tested and any person with a health card has access to that assistive devices program, um, that would be an example of perhaps a program that's a little bit better than, than other programs, although there's lots of drawbacks, so I don't want in any way to say that it's a, an ideal program because there's certainly lots of challenges. Um, and, but I think really where our biggest challenges are, are the inequity across the country and the different experiences that people can have depending on the province that they live in, as well as that basic and essential criteria that typically comes into play, which limits access to technology for people who are wanting to leave their house, which in most cases is everyone. Thanks, Emma. Um, we'll turn to Liz now. Hi. Um... Our um, payment model is almost entirely government funded um, and we've got two uh, streams of funding in New Zealand. So um, one is known as Disability Support Services, which is funded by the Ministry of Health for people who have a congenital or an acquired disability. So that's our clients with um, MS, ALS, CP, SMA, that sort of thing. Um, and then our second stream of funding is known as ACC, which is the Accident Compensation Corporation. And they fund um, support for people who have disability as a result of accidents, such as brain injury or spinal cord injury. Um, funding for um, ACC comes through taxes and levies. So on things like petrol, on uh, motor vehicle registration, and all employees and employers in New Zealand make a contribution to ACC out of their paycheck every week. Um, very few people self-fund. There are some charities and grants that people can apply to, but this would usually be for items that can't be funded through government options, so a pretty similar situation to the situation in um, Canada. Um, both funding streams are administered by um, companies that require specialist assessors to make a case for the funding proposed, and that's solution that they identify um, uh, outlining why that is suitable for the client and what goals will be achieved, those sorts of things. Um, the Ministry of Health funding pool is much more restricted resource and um, the funding is focused on essential need, so again similar to Canada, um, and um, so that would uh, central need to allow people to safely and independently manage their mobility within their home at school or at work. Um, so there are pretty significant gaps for people with regards to leisure and community access. Um, for clients under the Ministry of Health, um, one of the biggest barriers is waiting times for assessment, that can be a pretty large hurdle. So the assessing therapists usually work for hospital boards and um, as I'm sure is um, the case internationally, the demand is very high in that space um, and there are lots of competing priorities in that sector. Um, our ACC clients are generally pretty well resourced by comparison um, because a lot of their assessment support comes through private practice clinicians. Um, in both instances, the assets are owned by the funder, effectively the government, and the funder also manages the repairs and maintenance of that equipment. Um, if the equipment's no longer needed, or say a child outgrows their wheelchair and it's still in good condition, then that goes back to the funder and they may reissue that equipment to another client. One of our um, sort of caveats, I guess, around ministry funding is that um, they need the client needs to be open to a reissued um, piece of equipment in the first instance. Um, I think overall, New Zealanders have a great system and access to fantastic product. Um, the key challenge for us, which I'm sure is going to be a similar theme, is one of equity and timely access. Uh, within the sector, at, um, in particular, our Ministry of Health funded clients, there's, um, there's a sense, quite a strong sense of injustice. So two people who have um, very similar functional impairments who may, um, may have different options available to them dependent on the background of their disability. So whether they're born with a condition or whether they've had an accident. Great, thank you, Liz. Um, Kendra. Hi there. Thank you again for having us. Um, I, like I said, I'm a physical therapist. I've worked my entire career in the Veterans Health Administration in the United States. Um, I also um, carry an adjunct faculty position at the University of Pittsburgh. 
Um, while I have spent my entire career since 1993 functioning as a physical therapist in the Veterans Health Administration, I have also worked at the national level since about 2008 um, and have provided um, support and, and received insight and a lot of information about um, our organization from that national perspective. So um, we have about uh, around 160 um, comprehensive medical centers across the Veterans Health Administration, and we have over 1,200 sites of care. So those sites of care might include some of our long-term care facilities, our community-based outpatient clinics, um, our domiciliaries where we take care of our individuals with mental health challenges. So we have a lot of different kinds of sites of care um, at over 1,200 of those. We um, serve in the, in the Veterans Administration, we serve all of our veterans who are eligible for enrollment. Um, we have about 22 million um, veterans of the armed forces that live um, and are living in the United States, um, just based on different eligibility and, and income levels and different um, pieces of that puzzle. We actually actively serve just over 9 million um, veterans in our healthcare system. Um, what's unique about the Veterans Health Administration, even in contrast to our own private sector um, support in the United States, is we are one of those systems um, that is similar to other countries in many ways in that we are both the provider and payer of services. And so we are an all-encompassing system where our clinical providers are making the determinations about the comprehensive care that is required for the veterans being served in that system. Um, and we are also the payer of those service services, including payer of assistive technologies and all pieces of equipment that are provided to our veterans. Um, we have an extremely comprehensive um, availability of all types of technologies. Um, we have a national prosthetic and sensory aids service that provides national policy for um, the qualifications and the different types of devices for which we have the authority um, from the federal government to provide. And um, what's really fabulous about the availability is I, I really believe that um, across the globe, we probably have one of the most comprehensive um, systems for providing technology. So to accommodate for an individual that has a mobility impairment or a cognitive impairment or a mental health challenge, um, a medical um, you know, need, we can pretty much make the recommendations with the association with their goals and treatment plan to provide those types of devices. So far and beyond everything that individuals need for wheeled mobility and seating, we provide um, support for uh, work and school. So computer access, augmentative communication, environmental control, um, very unique in the United States that we also provide and fund um, home modifications, there's a separate benefit package for loans that allow a veteran who qualifies to either purchase a home that has been modified or to receive support to modify a home um, that would benefit and serve that veteran, um, and also vehicle modifications. So it really is a comprehensive system of taking care of the whole person um, and advocating for their everyday need. The other one that um, many of you know is one of my greatest passions is we are also able to provide support far beyond the home. Um, I mentioned school and work and in the community, we're also able to provide um, access and support for individuals to participate in their community in the form of adaptive sports and recreation equipment. So really fabulous that way. Um, so many opportunities to support our veterans um, from their point of entry in the system, which is usually initial um, onset of, of traumatic injury or disease or disability all the way through their lifespan, as long as they wish to have us um, to support them. In terms of just kind of some downsides of our system, because we are all inclusive, we don't necessarily have or coordinated all of the essential adjunct supports as well as some other systems. So I would say one area is um, we don't have the same level of technical support with all of our technologies that we're able to provide across that broad realm. And, um, you know, for example, in the United States, um, Kara kind of highlighted the organization of the system. There's a strong influence from our provider and supplier community to provide technical support, subject matter expertise and insight for those different kinds of technologies. And while there are exceptions, we are all inclusive and therefore our clinicians, our therapists, our doctors do a lot of technical work and, um, 
you know, kind of know how to wrench a chair because there's no one else that's going to be there to do it. So that's just kind of one of the downsides and one of the um, areas that we have opportunities for improvement. So thank you. Thanks, Kendra. Um, yeah, I think this adds to the discussion that Kara brought up just about how um, how many different payers and pathways and how the benefits for the veterans in the U.S. are, are uniquely different. Um, we'll now uh, hand it over to Nick. Hey, thank you. I, uh, I don't really have much to add because I know Kara and Kendra did such a great job of, you know, talking about the multiple payers here in the States. Um, I can just let you know that, uh, you know, in working with advocates from around the country for the past 20 years, um, each of those systems have, have their faults um, and, and struggles and hurdles in regards to access. So I know as we go through the session, some of those will come up and I can give you some of my, my thoughts on that. But, um, you know, um, I think having private insurance the entire time that I've been disabled, um, you would think that it's, you know, you have better options than Medicare, Medicaid, and that's not always the case. Thanks, Nick. Um, and then last but not least is Philippe. Oh, you're still muted there. I'm sorry, you have Sarah first. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, Sarah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, no worries. I just wanna say that I feel relieved that some of other um, countries and context and healthcare systems are as complex as the one in Colombia. So okay, I think we're good. And I just want to say that 95% uh, of our population is covered by the healthcare system. Similarly to the US, the military has a special uh, security system and they do have a specific guidelines in order to provide wheelchairs. For the rest of the population, unfortunately, um, we don't prioritize, as Kara mentioned, we don't prioritize assistive technology. So it is not covered on our healthcare, healthcare system. Um, but since we are a democratic, democratic country, uh, the life of the people or their access to healthcare, it's more important than the legislation. So they have to go to a court appeal process in order to ask a judge to ask the healthcare system to provide him a wheelchair with a wheelchair. And that's definitely a shortcoming because the judge, judges are not experts on assistive technology. So sometimes they just, um, ask the healthcare system to provide a product that is not what the user needs. And some other times they feel they do not need that product, but they actually do need it. So I think that's an important shortcoming and something that we hopefully will change in our country soon. And some other ways of accessing assistive products are of course out of pocket, but that doesn't necessarily uh, means that you're actually getting what you need. We also have massive donations and the shortcoming, as we all know, it's that it's mostly one size fits all. And we also, as uh, Emma mentioned, we have loan banks uh, from our government, particularly for those who are lower income. And in terms of availability, we have access to local manufacturer and international wheelchairs, but we don't have uh, product testing, so we don't know what the quality of those products are and if they are reliable for the users. And that's pretty much the, the assistive products that is a product that is more common. And for example, for those with intellectual disabilities, there is not a lot of uh, information in the legislations or products we can access. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, now, Philippe. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so Portugal, Portugal is probably one of the smallest countries in Europe, as you might know. Um, our system is, is actually very interesting. Uh, like uh, in the US and in Colombia, the army and armed forces have their own uh, system. Um, so they, they have their own hospitals and so on. So that's, that's a different system. So the, the, the system here in Portugal, so we have different ministries. So you have the Ministry of Health, that manages hospitals, for instance. Then we have the social security ministry and that uh, manages a lot of um, uh, rehab institutions out there. Um, and then we have the, the um, uh, professional education and professional um, training. Uh, for instance, if you have, if you have a, a spinal cord injury and you're uh, trying to get back to the working life, so there's uh, uh, education centers out there that allow you to learn a new profession, for instance, if you need to. 
uh, and um, adapt your uh, house, or your home, or your uh, your uh, place of work, or uh, find ways to get you to your place of work. Like for instance, the financial uh, car adaptations and uh, special computers and stuff like that. Um, all of them uh, drink, if I may say this word, from the state, from the government, uh, and there's a pool. Okay, so that's a budget, a yearly budget, and then everybody drinks from that pool. And uh, once the money's over, then it's over. Um, we do not have a system, in my opinion, thank God, that uh, I, I have a, a certain code for a cushion, for instance, and that code allows me to have a cushion that is worth $100. We don't have that. Uh, we have um, financial centers, obviously, that can be or not the prescribing center. The, then we have the prescribing centers with different levels of um, permissions. So if I have my, my family doctor, for instance, is not allowed to do a prescription of um, a highly configurated power chair, for instance. Now, it can do a bath chair or a, spe or a, a, a standard cushion or a bath or a, you know something like that. But if it is something specific, specific, then we need to go to a specialized center. That specialized center could be a rehab hospital. Uh, we have three big ones uh, spread, out, spread out the country that are really, really good uh, for spinal cord. And then we have what we call the cerebral palsy centers. And those are quite unique because the, the cerebral palsy population here is, is big. And there are um, almost in every city a special um, cerebral palsy center. Those are normally prescribers. Some of them, the big ones, are also financial. So this means that they get the money from directly from the, the social security ministry, for instance, and they manage their own budget. How they do, they have the multidisciplinary uh, team. You know, you, you know about this. So you have a physiotherapist, you have a speech therapist, so an occupational therapist, you have you know, uh, the family, you have the caregiver, everybody is, is a part of that um, uh, work. And the, um, so the team chooses whatever um, uh, assistive uh, technology they, they need, a power chair, manual chair, stroller, computer, um, you know, everything that the client could use, diapers, okay? So it's financed by that prescribing center um, and they make the choice. So I can, the prescribing center can do, um, can accept or can do a prescription of a standard steel wheelchair that will cost a hundred dollars or a uh, very highly configured standard chair uh, that will cost 40,000, okay? It's up to the, the, the center and the therapist, normally an occupational therapist and the doctor that sign off the prescription are responsible for whatever they're doing. So normally they do, they, they call in the dealers. Um, they are, um, there's no special uh, certification for the dealerships here. But the dealers are a, a normal, normally they have um, either occupational therapists or physiotherapists working for the companies and are the ones that are, that are uh, working with the products into those prescribing centers and doing the assessment together with the multidisciplinary team as a part of the dealership. So they are also responsible for whatever they are prescribing um, uh, into into the a certain a certain client. So. Um, uh what else uh the system i mean it's pretty cool that and my my dad was a wheelchair user for many many years um and he was you know every every citizen here no matter how much i make um i'm entitled to the same support of the government it doesn't matter if my wage is 500 euros or 5000 euros i have a title of exactly the same support by law Obviously, that we know that things then, <laughs> you know, tend to uh, have some kind of adjustments. But this is what the law says. Um, when I had uh, the need for my dad to have um, a standard, um, you know, it's, it was pretty straightforward to do an assessment with him, to go to a specialized center, uh, in this case, a rehab center. Uh, they all agree that the a standard was good for him. He did the prescription. We went to the social security. We we did the um, we we are required by law to have three different quotes for three different companies dealers, um, and that's all part of the process. Um, and then the downside of the system is that I need to wait for the money, and normally uh, that wait can be between six months up to a year. 
and this is the downside of the system because there is a delay uh, that you know sometimes you know happens that when the money comes um, the, the the client is already you know passed away for instance we had problems like this and this is terrible terrible another thing that is a downside of the system is that um, most of the times the the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Social Security sends the money directly to the families. That's a big problem. Okay, especially in these times of COVID, with so many people lost in their jobs and everything. Can you imagine? You know, if you all of a sudden you get a check of forty thousand forty thousand dollars or forty thousand euros, that, that can buy you a new car, <laughs> right? So they they very easily not everybody obviously, but you have problems where the families um, you know don't 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 know how to manage the money obviously, and they forget uh, quite easily the client that they have at the house. So that's the downside of the system, but everything else, I think our system is pretty good. For instance, you know, just looking out um, in, in the rest of Europe, you know, that we have, you know, many countries in Europe and every country has their own system. And, uh, you know, I go to my, my neighbors here at Spain um, and in Spain, you have this catalog, right? That every, and, and, and Spain have um, states as well kind of provinces, and they have their own reimbursement system or their own catalog of products, okay? So you may, you may go to Madrid and the, the government in Madrid will pay you $150 for a cushion and you go to Barcelona and the government in Barcelona will pay you 200 for the cushion or not pay you at all for that cushion in particular. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated system that gives a lot of, um, power to the dealerships to decide whatever they want to supply to the client. And that's, that's one of the things that I don't like about the system like that. Uh, I think that um, having a multidisciplinary team uh, doing the prescription, being responsible for the prescription, but also for the delivery of the product. So the, 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 the team must make sure that whatever they chose for that particular client is what is being delivered, especially you know after that, doing the training and so on that they need to do. So this is a little bit how the system works here in um, in Portugal. Thanks. That that's um, very interesting, Philippe, to to learn about um, to learn about the system. I want to remind the audience, please, to post any questions in the chat, and we'll be able to um, filter those through to um, to the presenters to answer. Um, the second question, and again, I'll I'll give each uh, each panelist three to four minutes to answer is. What do you see as an ideal policy for future consideration and what might it take to make happen? I mean, two real clear themes come up um, through pretty much every presenter, which are related to equity. So in Canada, it depends on what province. In Colombia, it depends on whether you have the legal means to go to court. In the US, you know, VA versus non-VA. So that equity to access for a single wheelchair seems to be one theme. And then availability of, of the technology. So Philippe said it's first come, first serve. If there's no money left, you have to wait. And I think that those are those are really key. You know, feel free to go outside of those two. But um, uh, we'll start with Kendra to, to answer that question on, on potential policy changes and how to make it happen to, to improve um, service or access to chairs. Sure. Thanks, John. It's a really good question. Um, you know, just to kick off, it was great to hear from all of the different panelists. And you know, John provided a nice summary. Is it's highly variable across the across the world, and even highly variable within um, different countries. Um, it seems like a while ago that we did the plenary session, and um, we talked about one of the emphasis was on high reliability organizations and sensitivity to operations as a key characteristic. And just hearing about all of these different ways that. Um, assistive technology is provided in different countries and how those policies dictate practice and, and the other way around is, is really interesting. Um, providing healthcare and doing business really is dependent on the environment in which we're working. You know? And it's really your point um, for, for each of us. I think in terms of, you know, what's, I think the question is related to, you know, what's that ideal policy or where do we need to go with policy um, determination and and implementation. I think that some components of our system in the Veterans Health Administration demonstrates um, a, a model for ideal policy. And, and those issues are really taking into account the whole person 
and um, the tasks and aspects of their everyday life. And I think that's something that we do really well. Um, we hear it's challenging, you know, it's challenging to hear that individuals in other locations in the United States or across the world are only provided devices for certain situations like in their home or for work or whatever that might be. So I think looking at the entire person um, and ca capturing all aspects of their life. And I really think that um, a system and a policy that demands accountability across the system is really important. Um, I think in a lot of situations we have anecdotal information um, of when we're doing well with our performance as a, as a healthcare system and as a payer and provider. And other times, you know, we, we could benefit from having a more established system of consistent outcome measures so that over time um, we have the ability to demonstrate we are meeting the mark, we are not meeting the mark, and what are our opportunities for improvement to make changes to really support the system. Um, I think, you know, there's different examples that have been shared from the panel and a lot of different examples, um, you know, I'm sure from the audience and we look forward to hearing your questions and comments as well. Um, if I was to choose a microcosm of the Veterans Health Administration, it is our spinal cord injury and disorder system of care. And what's really helpful in supporting our, um, our clients in this system is that it is an established and comprehensive system um, across our 25 regional centers in the Veterans Health Administration located all over. And what's, uh, what's great is that we do accept people and meet them at the onset of their illness or injury. So we provide comprehensive services for individuals with spinal cord injury. And then the disorders part captures multiple sclerosis and ALS. And we meet them at the onset of their illness or injury and follow them through their entire life. So through outpatient care, you know, comprehensive intensive care, acute care, rehabilitation, outpatient care. I think one of the aspects that has really held me and my colleagues, um, shout out to my colleagues, accountable over the years is that we provide at minimum annual evaluations for all of the individuals with spinal cord injury and disorders through their lifetime. And so we get a sense of, at least anecdotally, they're gonna show up and tell you if the device that, they, that you provided a year ago or five years ago is still working for them. And if it's not, you're gonna hear from them much sooner than their annual evaluation. And we can make those types of adjustments. Um, in terms of comprehensiveness, we have to also be able to de provide, deliver, and pay for care where our clients are. And that is not always in the major medical center in the big city in the United States. Um, we have a, a vast majority of our veterans um, that live in rural environments and we need to be able to follow them through their lifetime and take care of them through their lifetime um, with what works best for them because obviously they're functioning in the home and in their community is what is most important to them. And I think having that connection through our telehealth system of care is absolutely critical. Um, we heard from Dr. DeCiano in the opening plenary session of how you know, telehealth has just expanded exponentially um, as a result of the pandemic. And I think there are some of those silver linings that we have the opportunity to embrace um, with we must move forward with providing telehealth services, with providing payment, with getting our, um, our partners in this system into our clients' homes to deliver those pieces of technology and make sure that it's interfacing appropriately in their homes, at school, at work, in the community, and wherever that might be. So in terms of that ideal policy, I think that that is some of the key premises of providing that comprehensive care through the lifespan. Um, I think that where we all have the opportunity for improvement, including the Veterans Health Administration is establishing, if not already done so, let's start now with a uniform, um, data set of collection of information about the people that we're serving and outcome measures over time at consistent intervals through the lifespan to understand um, how we're doing with the services that we're providing. We are embracing, and this, uh, I'll keep it with the spinal cord injury system of care, the functional mobility assessment is being implemented across that system of care. And in addition to those 25 spinal cord injury centers, we, hit, we function on a hub and spoke model. So the hub is the spinal cord injury center. The spokes of that wheel are the smaller facilities that are closer to where that individual um, lives and, and exists. And we're collaborating with all of our systems so that that individual, regardless of where they're being seen, um, has a consistent 
system of gathering information and measuring their outcomes along that period of time so that I can be collaborating with my colleagues across the country in taking care of this individual and taking care of that population of individuals. So I think you know, that type of system um, you know, ties in with like a performance-based model of we need to be held accountable for the care that we're providing, the services that we're delivering, um, and, and know how we're doing along, you know, along that continuum of care. I think it's where we need to go. Thank Thanks, you. Kendra. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think it's, it's really nice to think about it as maybe the system is still fragmented, but if we all are optimizing outcomes, it may not, may not make too much of a difference how fragmented the system is. Um, I'll pass it on to Nick, who obviously has a unique perspective on this. So look forward to hearing your thoughts about, about um, changes in policy. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, I know Kendra touched on it, but you know it's so important as you treat patients and, and you see patients, not every, not every situation is the same. We're all unique. You could have the same level injury, same diagnosis, but what makes what is prescribed to me or a piece of complex rehab that would make or create greater independence for me might not be the same for someone else. So I think in regards to equity, you know, they're, they're ultimately the goal is to get people independent, but you need to look at each specific situation. Um, again, in the same diagnosis, different things are gonna be needed um, where to help me as opposed to somebody else. Um, I think here in the States, you know, we talked about Medicare. Um, Medicare and private insurance companies, you know, I have private insurance company and a lot of people ask, well, what are you so concerned about Medicare for? And, you know, it's important because typically private insurance will follow Medicare guidelines. So what Medicare implements now may affect me down the road with private insurance company or certainly when I get to the age of retirement. Um, I think Medicare is generally 65, I think Kara mentioned 65 years of age or people with disabilities are lumped into there as well. So, you know, potential solutions may be some type of, you know, carve out within there for people of working age. So there'd be, you know, I think it would just expand the opportunities or the equipment that we'd be exposed to based on, you know, the ability to go back to work. Um, the in-home rule, I know that popped up in one of the questions is just bizarre. Um, you know, I think that Medicare, you know, I, th their whole thing is, is to make sure that you're integrated, you know, into society, but how can you be, you know, how can they say that when they don't, you know, everything that they do is to get you not to leave the home. Um, so I think that that's kind of frustrating. One thing on a personal note, um, I was injured in 1996, I was 26 years old. And at the time, the internet wasn't as prevalent as it is now, but I had started to use a computer in rehab and I, you know, looked up spinal cord injury. And I mean, I hit every key demographic. I was in a, I was in a skydiving accident at the time. The median age was 26 year old male, high risk sports. I mean, it was exactly um, the, the numbers of annual estimated annual annual spinal cord injury was somewhere between 12 and 15,000 in the US. Um, that number, anywhere you look now, is that's always the number that's quoted to me. So that's 25 years later. Technology is different. Um, the rehab setting is so much different. I think a spinal cord industry, uh, spinal cord injury injury registry would help just because, you know, we work in DC a lot, our organization, and then we also advocate as individuals. And it's difficult to talk to legislatures when you don't, when you can't give them specific numbers, you know, they're trying to come up with budgets. And if they don't know the population that they're looking to serve in a year, it makes it really, really difficult to increase funding for what we need and to make our case. So I think that that's something that, um, I, I think something that I would like to see. And then lastly, with the Medicare is maybe a separate benefit for uh, complex rehab technology. And I think all of those things would go a long way, not only with the Medicare side, but also with the private insurers. Thanks, Nick. Um, that's really helpful. And then next we'll have, um, get back on the, my, my list, um, Philippe. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I yeah, I wrote a couple of sentences that uh, Kendra uh, <laughs> said here. So measurement outcomes. OK, I think that's the key word for everything that we do uh, and performance service model. And uh, I think that this is like in Portugal, again, I think I'm very fortunate uh, of the system that we have 
uh, within all the you know the all the the, the complexity of the system. Uh, we still have some kind of equity. So, uh, like I said, you know, every Portuguese citizen has exactly the same right to, no matter what the income is, to have the service, the, the same services. So that's that's something that we are able to do. Um, but I don't think we measure outcomes enough. So in our case, uh, I think measuring outcomes is really good because, you know, uh, like I said, you know, the system allows me as a prescriber to look at every individual needs like Nick was talking about of my client, because we know that every client is a different client. Um, I remember my dad, for instance, and I, you know, every time I'm, I'm talking about this, uh, my dad comes into my mind just because he had um, 48 years old when he, have, uh, he had a neurorisma in the aorta. Uh, and because of that uh, surgery, he became a quad. So, um, um, it was not a spinal cord injury, simply the, the spine was dry, uh, at least uh, this is the diagnosis uh, for him. And, um, you know, he got into the surgery operation uh, or the surgery and he come out six or seven hours late, later with three sores, three pressure injuries. Uh, I remember his injury in his uh, coccyx is, was so big that they had to displace the entire muscle to close it. So when you look at a client like this, and, uh, and, then, and then you say, okay, so he's using like a foam cushion, right? And then you have this type of surgery and you, say, you, you start thinking, well, what type of cushion I'm, I'm gonna use now, right? Because normally you, you normally go to air or something like that because it's a very uh, risky uh, uh, area there, right? Well, he was unable to use an air cushion. Uh, he was a tall uh, guy. He was not unable. He was very unstable on the cushion, uh, and he, he could not adapt it to the cushion. He went back to, and you will not believe this. He went back to a flat cushion, foam cushion that had one centimeter of gel in the surface, and that was the cushion that he used for the next fifteen years that he was alive after the surgery, and he never had the problem again. So. We had a prescription of, of, of air cushion, which is, you know, uh, uh, here at least a lot more expensive than a foam cushion like this, but we didn't have any, any follow-up. We didn't have any, you know, what's happening next? So, you know, do you need any help? Do you, you know, uh, do you need, the cushion is working, it's not working, stuff like that. I mean, it's like we're uh, spending money sometimes with over-prescribing things just because, you know, we think that this is the best, but then we, we don't have any follow-ups. And then, like uh, uh, Jonathan was saying, first come, first serve, yes, but then the first come is because it's overprescribed, the, the one that comes next doesn't have enough money because this guy took the money and it's not his fault, it's the system, you know, it's our fault. So uh, yeah, the ideal here, uh, at least in my country would be, you know, an extreme follow-up, uh, you know, measuring all these outcomes uh, and respect, um, you know, respect the products and respect the client because I think this, uh, what we need is this combination is really, really important. Perfect. Thank you, um, Philippe. Now, Liz. Hi. Um, I guess uh, similar to other um, speakers, the main priority for us is lifting um, opportunities and um, focusing on equity. So. Um, particularly lifting opportunities for people with acquired and congenital disability. Um, New Zealand's heading into some major transformational change in our health system in the next year or so, um, which is really exciting. It's also pretty ambitious in the middle of a pandemic. Um, they're essentially disestablishing the current system and building a new one, which is, um, yeah, interesting. Um, so as far as funding goes, we don't really know how the system is going to work um, and what's coming. Um, which is creating a bit of uncertainty uh, within our sector. Um, there is, however, some really strong consultation with groups and organisations and um, disabled people are um, being established as leaders within this new system. Um, so on the 1st of July this year, a Ministry for Disabled People is being established um, to guide the disability system transformation. Um, and the goals of this ministry are really aspirational. The principles are great. Um, logistics, not so sure. Um, we'll have to see how that goes. 
Um, hopefully the changes are going to be positive. So our, the core principles of um, the system that we're moving into are around choice, autonomy, um, equity and opportunity. Um, and as raised by um, some people watching this um, event, uh, community access obviously is probably going to be have a big flavour in that. Um, so the new ministry is going to cross social service divisions. Um, up until now, problems are approached um, with quite a siloed focus. So, um, uh, so yeah, the, the um, opportunities to see how assistive tech might create savings elsewhere, um, whether that be um, through return to work or, or whatever, um, can be a bit limited. So um, people that kind of focus on their bucket of money and bucket of funding rather than the bigger picture and the holistic kind of life of that client um, long term. So under the new system, I guess we're hoping for something that's a bit more cohesive and a bit more client centred. Um, and so the, the um, premise is, I guess, is that instead of paying someone to help me go do my shopping, um, I want to funnel that funding into buying myself a laptop so that I can shop online, or I want to um, upspeak my chair so that I can do my shopping myself. Um, just tapping into some of the other comments made by other people, um, knowing your population, I guess, is a challenge in New Zealand. So one of the things that we do um, have a really good handle on is our um, population have been injured by accidents. Um, and um, our, the funding system that I talked about, ACC, um, do have um, quite a strong focus on um, prevention. So um, they run advertising campaigns, for example, um, to, um, to encourage people to slow down when they're driving, to encourage um, wearing of seat belts, to encourage the wearing of bike helmets. Um, and um, sort of, we actually are running a campaign this summer, um, a new one, which is um, stop and think around what the impact might be. And it's um, quite a interesting um, advertising campaign around, you know, it's got images of kids jumping off rocks into, into swimming holes and then, uh, you know, stop and think what's the impact going to be, what's, how's, how am I going to shower myself, how am I going to get to the loo, um, all those sort of things are um, coming through in this advertising campaign. So that's quite an innovative, I guess, way to address um, risk within our community. What we don't have, however, is um, our other um, clients who have, um, for example, cerebral palsy, we're kind of just starting to move towards having a CP register. Um, and that's really um, for children. So we obviously, as we move, these children move into adulthood, we're going to have a register of um, people with cerebral palsy in New Zealand, which is going to be great. Um, however, there's big gaps with other um, for other um, clients. So, and we rely really heavily on NGOs, so non government organizations. So, um, organizations like the Muscular Dystrophy Association, for example, to be um, advocates for their population and um, uh, information sharers, those sorts of things. But they do rely on the user um, accessing them, if you know what I mean. So, it's they, yeah, so they're reliant on. Um, the user wanting to register with um, the organisation. Um, key challenge for us, I guess, is around workforce. So um, we've got, um, as I'm sure lots of other populations are experiencing, we've got a growing population, a much more complex population, um, and a health and disability workforce with um, the end user ratio to health and disability provider is pretty low compared to other countries. Um, and we've got challenges around paying and retaining our health professionals and preventing professional burnout. Um, I guess uh, for me, I would love to see um, therapists being therapists, less paperwork and more time with clients to help them achieve their goals. That would be the ideal. Um, thanks, Liz. Uh, we'll pass it on to Sarah now. Thank you. I agree with all that has been said. I totally agree that the user should be in the center of this process and uh, having a registry or a way of fully understanding understanding the needs of our population is fundamental. And I would love, also love to see a system that understands that assistive technology goes beyond healthcare. And in that way, like a lot of different stakeholders, like within the government, and as Liz just mentioned, other organizations will need to be involved in creating at least this ideal policy. Also follow up, I think it's super important as uh, was already mentioned. And when we talk about equity to access, I think it's important to 
have this equity in terms of access to a quality product and also to trained or certified personnel. Because particularly in my region, we don't have a lot of training opportunities and not of all of us are certified. So everyone does the, way, the best they can with what they have. So that definitely needs to be um, appropriate and available for all of us. So I think that a systems thinking approach to create this ideal policy, it's fundamental again, with um, involvement of different stakeholders. And I really loved what Felipe mentioned and Kendra as well about the specific centers of care. And in Latin America, I know that will be ideal and important, but also it can be um, difficult for those living in rural areas to access to these centers of care. So I think it's important to like to balance um, how or, or to think how we can give these um, centers of care or this specific, specific care to those living in rural areas as well. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Emma. Thanks, John. Um, so I think it's easy to talk about what would be perfect, right? What the ideal situation would be. And I mean, if I were to imagine a perfect scenario, um, it would certainly be something like a single payer system that in a, in, within universal healthcare, where we would have things based on client goals, um, as opposed to some kind of prescriptive access to certain technologies, and that it would, and I think really importantly that it would address participation in a full range of life. So that would mean you might not be limited to only one wheelchair, because we all know that most people who use a wheelchair need more than one wheelchair to meet their daily needs. Um, that we would see an appropriate assessment from qualified personnel and that that assessment would actually guide what people get rather than the funding being the limiter in terms of what people get, um, that we would see really good follow up and training. And so I think it's it's easy to describe that, but the, the more challenging question is how do we get there and, and how do we convince people that this is what's necessary? And not only that it's what's necessary, that it's what's right. And so I think there's a few things that I just from a bigger picture that I wanna make sure don't get missed. Um, one is from a rights-based perspective that really we're look, we need to look at this as a rights-based issue, that people have a right to have access to their communities, to participate in their communities and to engage in life. Um, that right is, and, and I speak on a more global level of right is ascribed by the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which I will note, the United States is still one of the only countries in the world that has not ratified the convention. Um, but for those countries who have, they have actually a legislative avenue to say this is a right and you as a country, our legislative body has committed to these rights and, and having an appropriate wheelchair or wheelchairs is part of that. So I think that's one thing that shouldn't be missed. Um, but I think as well, there's a compelling argument to be made for the fact that wheelchairs and other assistive technologies actually are incredibly cost effective as an intervention. And that if we don't provide wheelchairs and other assistive technologies, that we actually spend more money in the long run as a government. So if we're looking at a single payer system, if we're looking at insurance systems that are done on the national level, failing to provide that costs money elsewhere. And it, I think sometimes we don't see it from a systems perspective. So the money comes out of one pocket and not from another. And so those systems don't talk to one another, but the reality is that it does cost. So it, it it's an investment today in a long-term outcome. Um, and that speaks to the need to measure outcomes and the need to measure things like our return on investment and cost effectiveness. And for those of you who haven't seen it, um, At Scale has recently published a, a return on invest, uh, an investment case for assistive technology. And they've actually identified an estimated nine to one return on investment for the provision of assistive technology. So we're saying like, you provide appropriate technology, we get a ninefold return on investment on that down the road. And so I think we really need to, when we're looking at advocacy and when we're looking at how do we convince governments and convince our payer and our paying systems, we need to look at it from that perspective. This is about economics as much as it's about rights. And we can talk about rights till we're blue in the face, but if we don't talk about the economics of it at the same time, I don't think that we're going to actually get where we need to go. Um, so my soapbox, uh, the return on investment is there, but the rights are the critical piece. Thanks, Emma. I think that that is a powerful message. And, and I think trying to understand how these systems can talk to each other. Philippe's example of they only have so much budget. Um, 
but maybe they're spending it inappropriately or they're not realizing if they increase the budget, they could save elsewhere is really important. Um, last but not least, we'll have Kara um, talk about her ideas for policy changes. Thank you. I really appreciate this question. I think it's probably the one that led me into getting my PhD because after advocating on a single level for so long, I was like, how can we make a bigger change? And um, in my case, it was research and greater awareness and some of the systems and the policies that, that govern the access to wheelchairs and um, CDM mobility equipment. So um, I think there's been great points said already. Uh, and in the United States, I 100% agree that our social awareness and that our lens on equity is limiting our um, healthcare for all. So I, not that I think that we need to definitely change to a single payer system or anything like that, but I do think um, I was speaking actually with a Canadian engineer probably like five years ago when we were at a Hicks Picks work group meeting and he was trying to get some coding for some of his products and he said, uh, in his speech to the Hicks Picks work group, he said that he um, that we consider wheelchairs and ambulation a right, but not necessarily use of the arms. And so, you know, we're not covering this stuff right now. And he said, I can say that as a Canadian, it may not come so well from you as as an American. Um, but it is true that for a long time, CMS, our center for our federal center for Medicare and Medicaid services, have seen the population of people who need complex rehab as the same as people who um, may be over the age of 65 and need Medicare. And so, definitely, um, what Nick said. Nick, right? I'm sorry, I'm so bad. Yes, with names. Um, but what Nick said about Medicare setting the precedence for the other payer systems in the United States is a truth. And that can be a detriment to people who don't fit that over 65 demographic. Um, and so I think that's changing a little bit. Um, and I think that there's some things that we can do about it. Certainly uh, the separate benefit category legislation that we have been proposing over the last like 10 to 12 years and trying to get to pass for CRT equipment would help us carve out some of those things. So including um, being able to provide for mobility in home and the community for people who need it. I think that would be super, super important. Um, and. There are some conversations happening about the in the home rule. Um, and the first uh, step from what I've heard is going back and looking at the history of the in a home room and trying to document that maybe. Um, but there definitely are conversations about that because the equity of that rule is not in line with, you know, especially what we as healthcare providers believe that people need. Um, so in that, I also think that there's a possibility of for seating and mobility therapists who work in a dedicated clinic. Um, I don't know, maybe looking at the coverage, um, the, the funding for the healthcare services that we provide in the United States. Kendra, you mentioned that the VA is able to provide an annual evaluation for wheelchair users. That's awesome. Like being able to provide provide that consultative service and being able to then um, head off any injury or any uh, equipment modifications that are needed before they result in a detrimental con consequence, I think could be really, really powerful and also relate to that financial piece that Emma so eloquently um, described. So what might it take? Um, you know, I've been involved now in this policy change for a couple of years, and we actually, I, I was a part of the team that has proposed the national um, coverage determination reconsideration request for power seat elevation and power standing systems. So in uh, September of last year, the year before last, I believe, November of 2020, of 2020. I'm sorry, I'm getting my dates mixed up, but we submitted a national coverage determination reconsideration request to CMS with the item coalition in NCART, um, the Christopher Reeves Foundation, and I know I'm leaving people out, so please, um, I apologize for that. But in that process, our everything was de deemed complete, everything was deemed um, and, and they've reviewed the reconsideration request. We have met with CMS many times. And uh, most recently this uh, in December, right before Christmas. And somehow we still are missing that impetus to be able to move this legislation forward and, or this policy reconsideration request forward and have them make a determination on it. 
And that's really frustrating because to, I'm a person who, if I tick off the box and you have this set in place with this timeline, I feel like I should be able that, you know, you keep up your end of the bargain. Um, and so I don't know what it might take. I think economic evaluations definitely help in that. Now we did that with this, um, but it wasn't necessarily seeing the gains um, in preventative that this preventative um, these preventative steps might take in covering this equipment. And so I do think that that's an, a really important part of it. Um, social and group pressure. I'm like, I don't know. A part of me says like. I don't want it to come to that and have to come to that all the time. But at the same time, I think that Steve Gleason, you know, and all of the um, advocacy that he promoted with the um, SGDs has shown that social and group pressure makes a difference. And so being able to um, get people on board with that, we did have a letter um, from Congress people to CMS to move the sea elevation and power standing policy request forward. That you know, the, the people at CMS said they heard that. So um, I think it's just a combination of a whole lot of things and trying to do the best we can to raise awareness and um, move it one step forward. Kara, um, thanks for that. And we're gonna move to questions. We have about 10 minutes, but I first wanted to give Nick an opportunity to respond, especially about the, um, given his role um, in terms of um, that kind of pressure and, and advocacy. Thanks. Kara, I believe United Spinal was in on that with the Iodum Coalition. So I just wanted to add that, but that's not really my main point. My main point is, is that we were talking before and it ties into what you were talking about with Medicare. You know, I think their three mandates are independence, self-care, and access to the community. You know, they consider complex rehab technology totally different than exactly what their mandates are. You know, these aren't convenience items. They help people become more independent, whether it's school or work. Um, access to their health care, ADLs, and countless other everyday functions. So it's contradictory to really what they're, um, you know, to what they're talking about. And I think you talk about monumental in trying to get this overturned. You know, one thing that would go a long way, and this would be really, really monumental, is congressional leaders get superior health care. If they were, if they had the same, you know, if their Medicare, if they were, uh, if their insurer was Medicare, uh, I think you'd see a lot of these things move. Yeah, that's a good point, and and something we hear on uh, on cable news quite frequently to promote other types of healthcare um, changes. So we're going to move into the Q and A session, and um, to the panelists, I'm going to post the first question um, related to something we've already discussed about home versus community, and ask um, Kendra to reply first or respond first. Yeah, sure, John. Thank you. Um, really looking for you know there was a suggestion from the audience about how do we advocate for you know, coverage of devices that impact the individual in, in home and community. And, um, you know, it's just, again, great to hear from all of these different perspectives of how things work. We really have to understand how things work. Um, I appreciate, you know, Kara's response of like, well, Kendra said they have an annual evaluation system in the VA and um, that acknowledgement, when you grow up in a system of care, grow up professionally, right? Whether, whatever that healthcare system is, whatever that country is, it's what you know. And so, you know, my first 15 years of my career, I, I did annual evaluations of our people with spinal cord injuries and disorders, and that is carried on. I didn't know anything different. And so it's shocking to me when I would hear, well, what do you mean as a therapist, you work with a supplier, you figured out what this individual needed, and then they went home and somebody else delivered the device and you never saw them again. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so foreign to me. And, I, and I, I, I just agree with, you know, that approach of we have to have accountability, both anecdotally of how people are doing, and then with established uniform data sets and outcome measures to see how people really do over time. In terms of our universal advocacy for how do we take care of people where they exist, home and community, um, I, I feel like there's a discussion about what is the universal approach or, or how can we come together, at least for a global approach, to implement and, and, and kind of address policy issues. And I think one of our um, advocacy realms is to look to the World Health Organization and the ICF model, right? To look at classification of functioning disability and health as a uniform system that we across the globe, regardless of where we are in the world can agree 
that it is about the person and the body systems and structures is kind of the no brainer for most of us. Of like, we get that. Let's evaluate the person. Who are they and what's going on? But what's with such a, a you know a powerful advantage is the inclusion of activities and participation. And if you look at activities and participation, we cannot negate that that is inside the home and everything outside the home, which is you know most of of our lives of, of existing in the home and getting out and about and participating with families and coworkers and students and having fun out on the ski mountain, whatever that might be. So I just want to initiate this conversation with, you know, the way to advocate for it is with a common mission, with a common approach. And I want to propose that, you know, the ICF model is an opportunity for us to use as a platform to move forward towards a global approach with, with this advocacy event. So curious what others might add to that. And go ahead, Kara. Thanks, John. Uh, and just adding to this conversation, I just wanted to emphasize that Medicaid in the United States does cover equipment for the community. Um, Gene Minkle in particular has been um, instrumental in advocating for that in New York. And so if you have any questions, I mean, certainly wherever we can leverage um, equipment in the community and gathering data on how that makes a difference. I Thanks, Kara. Um, anybody else want to um, comment more on this question related to um, providing mobility for uh, home and the community before we move on to the next question? Yeah, go ahead, Emma. I think one of the things that's worthy of consideration is what happens when we don't provide the equipment and actually spelling that out for insurers, right? If, if you do not provide this equipment for this purpose, here are the potential outcomes and here is what happens. Um, I think sometimes we focus a lot on why somebody needs it as opposed to what happens if they don't get it. And sometimes that's a compelling uh, reason when we are writing letters of justification and when we're advocating on behalf of a client. So remembering that we need to talk about both. Thanks, Emma. I, Please can, go ahead. can I add something? Thank you. I would like to add that it's important to explain like this system, how this return of investment that Emma was talking about it's due to education. Like we are returning nine out of each dollar because the people, this person is going to school and then going to work and being part of this community and so on. We're not returning that investment because they are sitting at home, right? So I think that's also an important point to make. Yeah, I, I think it, it really, and the next question I put in the, um, in the chat to everybody and I'll read for the audience, feeds into the same dialogue about having to provide evidence that the impact is really only felt when you provide mobility for the community and when you provide some kind of um, performance measures where you can see how well you're doing and how well the user is doing. So this question is, is it seems sometimes in the US equipment is determined by payers wanting to save money and not necessarily providing an appropriate, providing the appropriate equipment by not looking at the whole person or the big picture with issues that can come from inadequate equipment. How can we better inform these payers on the needs of appropriate equipment and how this will actually save in the future? And I bring that up because that's a really challenging question, but it really does speak to making sure we have metrics, we're measuring them and we're sharing them in a way that um, all parties that are looking at this full system are response, you know, responsive to those questions. So um, I'll open it up and um, maybe ask uh, Liz to comment first on, on that question. I think um, in our context, um, similar to the comments made by Emma and Sarah, I think it's putting forward that case of um, what we what's going to happen if we don't provide the solution. I think that's, um, that's certainly something that we, um, that frames up our justification. So we do need to provide both. So what will happen and what, um, what we're going to avoid if we do provide a funded solution. Yeah. Great. Um, anybody else want to comment? We have a couple more. Hey, if you don't mind, just a quick comment. Um, are we doing enough in training and education? Uh, are we just concerned in training and educate the rehab specialists and, you know, doctors, therapists, and so on? Are we paying attention to all the people around 
uh, us that need to be, um, that have some kind of education to learn about this because we have exactly the same problem here, right? I have someone in the office sitting at the desk saying yes to this, no to that, you know, based on what? So that's, that's my comment. Yeah, and um, that's a really good point to end on because I think it ultimately does come back to making sure the user gets the right product, um, depends on the qualifications of the provider and to make sure that they're dialed in and focusing on the right pieces. Um, I wanna thank all the panelists. This has been a great discussion. We've all learned a lot. I certainly have about the different policies and, um, and really I think recognizing that there's nothing standard out there, whether you're in a country, uh, particular country, it depends on where you go and what, uh, what, you know, what payers that you know about perhaps um, is really probably determines the quality and the type of chair that you're getting. So again, thank you. And I'll hand it back to, um, to the Wranglers of ISS, uh, both Mark and Rachel. Thank you, John. I'm just going to quickly, again, thank our panel for all of that exciting and interesting information. Um, a bit of a call to action there. Um, if, if you were looking for it, the CEU code, oops, sorry, is 6 Oscar Juliet 1 India 8 6 OJ 1 I 8. And that will also be in the chat. Great. Thank you, guys. That was a great panel discussion. Uh, I took down a lot of notes personally here for some of the work that we're doing. And I'm hoping as we move on with future ISSs around the world, we can continue to have these discussions and perhaps look back on 2022 in the not too distant future to say, remember when we talked about those problems we have that don't exist anymore. I know that's wishful thinking, but that's certainly where, where we're, what we're striving for and where we're headed. So a couple of things is, is first of all, just thanking everybody. This conference was, I think, a, a great success. Uh, I know we had to pivot quite a bit. We had to change the date several times and we had to eventually go completely virtual, but I don't think we could have asked for a better um, outcome. And I want to thank, obviously, the entire ISS team that has worked diligently for the last couple of years to get where we are today. This just doesn't fall on your doorstep. It doesn't happen automatically. So I think it's a great testament to the hard work they did. And obviously, all the speakers that contributed and, again, endured the changes moving online but the presentations were absolutely fantastic. I had a chance to go to quite a few of them. And the nice thing is, is these are all recorded. They will be in the Cvent portal for a year. So I know that uh, I'll be watching all of them over the next few few days or so as, as time permits. And I think mostly too, thanks to the exhibitors who also I think endured quite a bit of change and also learning to adjust to new formats as, as we move forward. Um, and then the volunteers, obviously, several of them in the sessions. I think having, you know, having the having volunteers there ready to assist with anything helps a conference run very smoothly. And obviously, it, it impacts well on the experience of the attendees and the speakers and keeps people coming back. So with this closing, I will just say the 38th International Seating Symposium is only going to be a little over a year away. We're, we're playing a little bit of catch up here. Uh, it's going to be in April. It's going to be from the uh, 12th to the 15th, if I have my days correctly. It's basically going to be a, a Thursday, Friday, and half-day Saturday event. We will have pre-conference workshops on, on the Wednesday, which is the 12th and most likely gonna be opening up the exhibit hall that Wednesday night. So if you wanna save the date, put those in your calendar and we hope to see all of you in Pittsburgh in person. If not in person, we're also going to continue with this online format as an option because we think it brings tremendous value and can also help uh, get people to information that might not otherwise have access to it. So with that, I just want to again say thank you. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I hope to see you all back in 2023. Thank you.